Okay, great. You are on so, your first slide. Yes. Uh, this is a picture of the Eunice Prairie. Um, I'm here. And I'd like to thank y'all for, for letting me come uh, or remotely uh, speak to you um, about our prairies in Louisiana. A little history. And just to double check, can everyone hear me clearly? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Just a little history. Uh, Louisiana once had two and a half million acres of, of coastal prairie. Um, but by 1986, uh, coastal prairie was declared extirpated in Louisiana by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Um, and this is just two years after the National Heritage Program was founded. Um, but then in, in 1988, uh, a few prairie remnants were found along agricultural strips in between fields and, and railroad remnants and adjacent to roads. Um, so some work began to try to salvage these remnants. Um, no one agency really led the charge in the negotiations um, with, with the property owners. Um, they kind of take turns here and there. And, and it, it ultimately, by 2010, um, a lot of these prairie remnants had been lost. Uh, a few to agricultural expansion and overspray of herbicides, um, some with uh, railroads the same way. Uh, but a lot of them, most of them, were lost due to fire suppression, a lack of fire. Um, and in 1989, uh, Cajun Prairie had that preservation society was, was founded. Um, and then later on in 1988, uh, some more work continued trying to reestablish uh, the Dural Prairie, a 350 acre tract. Currently, we have less than 100 acres in prairie and probably only 30 of it's in what you call prime prairie um, land. Um, by 1998, 2003, uh, Cajun Prairie Habitat Preservation Society uh, reestablished three prairie tracks in Eunice, totaling 15 acres. Now, these prairie tracks, it was a reestablishment. So it was not prairie on the ground, it was a caliphate. Um, and what we did, the society, uh, was collect seed and plugs from prairies that were being lost, uh, those remnants, and we put them out on these properties to reestablish uh, the prairie and preserve those genetics um, and, and perhaps microflora as well. Um, then, a, a great discovery, late 2009, 2014, and continuing on actually to this day, Louisiana Natural Heritage Program, Chris Reed, uh, began discovering uh, large prairie tracts on grazing land in southwest Louisiana, up to 2,300 acres so far. And there's more land that holds some potential uh, for prairie. Um, so you might ask, why, if, if we got all this land, if we got some, some actual prairie land, why are we concerned with um, some of these remnants, or not even remnants, reestablishments um, in areas like Eunice? Um, and here you can see there's an image of the, uh, of the city of Eunice, uh, the two main highways, Highway 190 and 13, are right there at the crosshairs in the center where Eunice is. And those three tracks in the northeast uh, are, are prairie tracks in Eunice. You, so you can tell it, it's within um, the town of Eunice. And here's a close up look. You can see, and you can see a little industrial area to the west, uh, which is beginning to approach on our property. And we have houses, uh, residential properties, um, pretty much on all sides, and a rice dryer uh, splitting the property in two uh, to the north, and railroad tracks to the north as well. So, so again, why why work and put so much effort into these properties in an urban setting? Well, for number one, they're high genetic diversity. They contain a lot of seeds and material from these remnants. Um, and, and not only that, the perhaps soil biota and other significant uh, aspects of prairie that we are not fully understanding yet. Also, these three, these three prairie tracks are one of the few prairies uh, with public access. And in fact, it's, it's pretty much the only prairie uh, with, with public access, consistent public access in, in Louisiana. Um, LSU, ULM, university classes, um, 
master naturalists, everybody comes to these prairies um, to study and learn about. Occasionally we get to get out on some of the private land prairies, but this is what's, what's uh, readily available to us. Um, so, so again, why burn? To me, uh, it's not prairie unless it's burned. Um, we can have prairie gardens, we can have demonstration plots, but it's not true prairie um, unless it's burned. So for us, these areas have to be burned um, annually or, or nearly so. And, and they have been burned um, for almost the last 15 years or so, um, rel maybe within, with the exception of three or four years out of the last 15 they've been burned. Um, and how do we do this? First, it started with community development. Um, Malcolm Padrine, Margaret Fry, Dr. Allen, those who lived in Eunice at the time, um, especially Malcolm and Margaret, who, who are longtime Eunice residents, began rallying the community um, around the prairie. Uh, all of their students would come out, collect seed, put, uh, put, to put out in the prairie, collect plugs. Um, they would get friends, garden clubs, uh, et cetera. So, the, current, the, the community might have not have necessarily understood um, all the details and inner workings uh, of a coastal prairie, but they began to kind of take ownership uh, in, in this area. Um, there was a lot of media outreach, especially newspapers, but also some TV and radio, and Cajun French radio, I believe, as well. So, so the, the word around Eunice was getting out that this is prairie um, and it's supposed to be here and fire is a part of, uh, of, of prayer. Um, so getting the community comfortable with it was the first step and taking ownership in, in these parcels were the first steps. Uh, the second step uh, was developing sound relationships with the local fire departments. And uh, when I, as president or past president and, and uh, the, the burn committee uh, chair as well. None of us ever really meet with the fire department. We send Margaret and Malcolm, the people who grew up in Eunice, the people who know Eunice, the people who know many of the political figures and key players in that area to talk with the fire chief and to prepare for the burns. Then they relay that information back with us. Uh, every fire, every burn we have, we make sure we have the fire department out there. Um, the fire department never even really gets out the truck. Uh, they stay there, they pull up, their, their presence simply reduces any type of panic and concern. Um, and we always tip them well. Uh, so so when, when they leave, they're happy as well. Um, we are sure to follow smoke management guidelines and, and regulations, but in such an enclosed area, it is hard to, to do that. Um, but we managed to get uh, a burn, at least a portion of a burn, uh, on the prairie uh, every year. Um, and another thing I can't help to ignore, um, but this is a low income area of town. Um, when you look, and what people's stereotypes are of low income areas, um, they're synonymous with uh, perhaps one down buildings or dilapidated buildings and vacant lots. Um, so to see, for, for many people, a prairie is nothing but a vacant lot. To see a vacant lot in a less affluent area of town is nothing out of the norm. Um, so perhaps people are more comfortable um, with this type of landscape uh, in this portion uh, of town. Uh, Alright, Brian, I think that uh, we're going yes. to go ahead and go to the question, and I will relay the, okay. relay the questions to yes. you so that you can hear them. Okay, what, so they're burning like just, um, you know, in the middle of a town. I mean, literally in the middle of a town. So you guys who have visited this site. So what questions do you have in terms of doing prescribed burns in urban communities for Brian? When do they burn? When do you burn? What time of the um, year? 
We burn um, various types here. We burn, we do spring burns. Um, we do winter burns. We do fall burns. Um, summer burns. We did a summer burn this past year um, in, in early June, I believe. Yeah. So we burn all times of the year. Andy. How big is Eunice? How big is, is, is the metropolis of Eunice? I am not sure. I would imagine um, 15 to 25,000 people. How big are your burn areas? How big are your burn patches? So we have 10 and two, two and a half acre uh, patches. What was that? 10. Yeah. Can you repeat that, the, the units? Uh, we have a 10 acre uh, patch and two, two and a half acre patches. But you don't burn all 10 acres at one time, you said? Sometimes you burn yes, a patch of them? Yeah, we, we try to. Not, it doesn't happen all the time, but we try to. So when you schedule a burn, your intention is to burn the whole thing or is to burn it in yeah. patches? Uh, burn the whole thing, sometimes all 15 acres, all three locations. Um, could you describe those smoke regulations? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the smoke rig? I mean, you literally have houses across the street. Can you tell us a little bit about where you try to push the smoke and the regulations that exist? Yeah, so I am I'm no uh, burn expert, but we need to ensure that we do have uh, some significant uplift. Um, we need to ensure that we never try to burn with wind to the south because we have 190 there and wind to the uh, going to the uh, west we have highway 13 that way we prefer north and northeast um, so we try to find those days uh, that way uh, it, it avoids this the southern it avoids the major highways and southern portion of, of the town the downtown area um, but with such a it is a relatively small area um, so we are able to typically get the property burned and the smoke away um, starting at 10 o'clock and, and done by two or three, usually sometimes noon or one, depending on humidity and other factors. So it goes pretty quickly. We got a couple and of we always try to burn on a weekday. Uh, less people at work, not at home. Um, it, it, it tend, we tend to get less calls, if any, uh, during weekdays. Do you go to the neighbors uh, before you burn with like a flyer, like a burn is going to happen on this date or this date or within this time we, rate? We have. Um, we don't typically do that. Um, we usually just show up, burn, get it done, and leave. Up. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it happens pretty fast, so, so the, the less... That, in most cases, that, that would be ideal and, and, a, and, and, a, and a good thing to do. Um, I, we have had some relationships with the neighbors, and they seem to be okay with it and, and accept it, and there hasn't been a whole lot of complaints. So um, we've kind of just been going with the status quo, is, uh, and, and, which is um, uh, the, the less of a deal we make it, the, the easier it is. Uh, the more under the radar it is, uh, the easier it is. But we do, we notify state police, we notify the fire department, they're out there, we notify the Louisiana Department of Ag and Forestry. We go through all the protocols, we do abide by the Louisiana uh, smoke management regulations. How large is the burn? And we have a certified, somebody always signs off on the burn plan. We have a burn plan for each, each time we burn. And it's signed off. How large is the burn? So we're, we're operating um, Can safely, under God, same regulations. All right, Glenn? Uh, how large is the burn crew? How many people? Are, how, are they volunteers? Or how big is the burn crew? How many are volunteers? And do you get anybody from the local neighborhood that helps? Um, not particularly from the local neighborhood, but from units, yes. So many people from units do help. Um, the burn crew varies. So Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries can't burn the property because it's within the city limits, but Louisiana Department of Ag and Forestry can. So sometimes if we don't have enough volunteers or time, we can get them to burn for a big charge $300 uh, to burn 15 acres, which is pretty good. Um, they do all the prep and everything. Um, and we use that option a number of times. And we do have two or three people that are certified prescribed burners within Louisiana. So we'll use them if we want to do a burn uh, on our own, which we have. 
several times, and we've gotten all volunteers with a crew of six people. Yeah. Okay, uh, Brian, that is all the questions we have. But one thing I want to mention is we are going to be sharing contacts. If you don't want us to share your contact of who came, just let me know, and I'll not include your email. But we'd like to include your contact information. I'm sure people have more questions about burns. There's a bunch of, you can't see it, but there's a bunch of fire bugs here. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for joining us, Brian, taking some time out of your day, and we appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, well, one last closing thought, it, it, in my opinion, just burn it. An incomplete burn <laughs> that shirt. Is, much better, is much better than, than a complete burn. So if you wait, if you can do some small patch burning even to, to reduce conflict uh, in urban areas, do that. Whatever you do, just, just burn it. <laughs> You're making our next t-shirt, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Bye-bye.